Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to our River Herring in the Mystic public webinar. We are so excited to talk to you about our favorite fish uh, today. So I'll start off with uh, introducing myself and then I'll introduce our wonderful fellow speakers today. Um, my name is Daria Clark. I'm the engagement manager at the Mystic River Watershed Association. And I'm joined by my colleague, Andy Hersina, who is our watershed scientist. Andy has been at Myra for eight years and in his role as watershed scientist, leads our water quality programs and is our resident consultant on all things data and wildlife, especially herring and birds and now dragonflies. Um, I'm also pleased to welcome our guest speaker, Ben Gahagan, who is a diadromous fish biologist with the Massachusetts Division of Marine Fisheries. Ben's research focuses primarily on monitoring and restoring diadromous fish populations in Massachusetts, and that is how we came to work with him on river herring in the Mystic. Um, so just for this presentation, feel free to drop questions in the Q&A box as you think of them. Uh, we may answer a couple of them during the presentation, and if we don't get to your question um, during the presentation, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end to address them. And with that, uh, I'll move on to our agenda and then pass it off to Andy. Um, so first, a little bit about Myra, about what the Mystic River watershed is. Then we'll move on to this amazing ecological story of river herring in the Mystic. Um, Andy will present some of our data from 2021. We'll talk about what's next for herring in our watershed. And then we'll pass it to Ben to talk about some statewide herring trends. Great, so welcome, um, Andrew Hrasena again, and um, delighted to talk to you about um, the Mystic River watershed and about the story of river herring in our, um, in our highly urbanized part of Massachusetts. So the Mystic River watershed is this area of land that drains to the Mystic River and out to Boston Harbor around, um, Greater Boston, it is 1% of the land area in Massachusetts, but it has 6 or 7% of the population of Massachusetts. It's a highly urbanized, highly um, densely populated by people um, um, part of the state. And keep that in mind as this, this story unfolds that we're, we're going to share with you. This ecological restoration story, this, like, you know, large scale animal migration is happening in the most urbanized through often invisible to people, but through um, the most urbanized watershed in New England. Um, just a little bit about our organization we're devoted to. We were actually founded in 1972, which is I think not coincidentally the year of the Clean Water Act and a lot of activism around uh, the environment. Um, this is a little map of our projects as they've evolved over time. Um, just back to 2009, uh, we had our, our core program was water quality, which I still manage. Uh, we have a baseline program where volunteers help us acquire water quality data with the aim of finding pollution sources and um, eliminating them. Um, but uh, over time, and we had always an outreach component where we're, we're working always to share the data we have with residents and fellow citizens in order to engage them in environmental protection and uh, restoration as well. And we use data. Uh, the reason we're gathering data is always to influence policy. So it's always with an aim to acquiring useful data, data that can, that can um, cause change in the world. So that's kind of our core water quality um, uh, history uh, at, in the organization. But over the past several years, we've, we've branched out to include other um, aspects of environmental management and environmental um, monitoring uh, and even climate adaptation. So, over time, we've added programs. A water chestnut program is an invasive plant program on the river. We've, we're involved in green infrastructure and nutrient pollution uh, issues in the watershed. Um, the river herring monitoring program started in 2012, and that's the story we're gonna look at today. Um, but we've also added a green waste program. Uh, these are all led by other colleagues of mine um, to 
revitalize and connect the parks along the, the Mystic River from, you know, from Somerville, from uh, and Everett, all the way up to um, the Mystic Lakes and beyond. Um, and we have rec more, more recently environmental education and climate adaptation and like straight up ecological restoration projects that we work on with partners, um, including uh, in an exciting way coming up in Belle Isle Marsh in, um, in the lower watershed. So that's just a little bit about us and how our programs have grown. Um, but the story we're telling is this, um, again, urban ecological restoration story. Um, I'm really delighted that Ben will be here to, um, to talk about uh, his perspective on our story um, because he, he's, there's no one more expert on river herring biology and ecology and no one more expert on the state of river herring populations all across our state and no one better uh, place to talk about um, kind of most importantly that efforts uh, to uh, restore um, historically uh, low populations of river herring um, through a variety of means, which he will talk about. But if I'm expert on it, and Ben's the expert, if I'm expert on anything, it's the, the local history of our monitoring program. But that local history tells this amazing uh, story, I think. So, uh, here goes. Um, first, yeah, many people here will probably know a lot of this background, but for folks who don't, river herring are, is a kind of collective name for two particular species, of uh, uh, alewife and blueback herring, uh, who, which um, uh, are mainly ocean going fish. So they spend most of their year foraging and schooling in the ocean. Um, but return every year to spawn in fresh water. Um, kind of when I, before I learned about river herring, my, my model was always uh, salmon, which of course return to fresh water to spawn. Salmon tend to have the habit of dying at that at spawn and then die in the fresh water, right? That's the end of their life journey. Um, river herring uh, return uh, to the ocean. Uh, adults spawn, uh, Juveniles develop in lakes, but the adults return to the ocean. They're, they're economically and ecologically significant. They're involved in a lot of food webs, formerly super abundant and um, economically important fishery. Um, uh, and this is just a view of the life cycle from, you know, entering, coming out from the ocean into uh, spawning territories in inland, um, the spawning adults return to the ocean, juveniles um, hang out for the summer, grow to um, more or less uh, larger sizes and then uh, enter estuaries and then out to the ocean to, to join their um, fellow river herring um, schooling in the ocean. Um, one just aside here is that um, this is unusual behavior for fish, right? It's a very stressful, uh, transition from saltwater to freshwater. And only, I, I, I believe it's true, and Ben can correct me, that fewer than 1% of fish species are uh, diadromous. That is either they, they go from saltwater to freshwater or freshwater to saltwater. Um, unlike bird, many, many bird species, we're familiar with bird migrations. Um, many fewer fish uh, do this and um, Anyway, that's just an aside. There's an interesting debate in the literature, um, which Ben will uh, know much better than I, about what whether this was an ocean-going uh, original population that sort of evolved to use freshwater habitats for spawning, or whether it was a freshwater original population um, that learned to access food resources in the ocean. I, I think that the current uh, best evidence is, is that it's the former uh, rather than the latter, but. Anyway, so these are these are these fish. They migrate from the ocean to freshwater, and they do it um, in great number. They used to do it in great numbers. So this is a graph of uh, a kind of proxy for river herring populations, right? This is commercial landing. So this is the amount of fish, number of pounds of fish on the y-axis caught commercially 
from 1887 to 2015. Um, you know, there's uh, the way I interpret this graph. So this is a very loose proxy for how many fish uh, there are, but uh, you know, this, this 19th century data is spotty. Um, uh, of course, record keeping was worse. You know, you, the, I interpret that upward slope on the left-hand side here as better record keeping, but also sort of increased human appetite, human population, and you know, uh, increased efficiency of and intensity of um, fishing operations. Um, it led kind of famously uh, in the 70s to uh, a local um, uh, crash in the population. So this is like, a, a, and again, I, Ben would be the person to describe the population dynamics here, but this, th this kind of crash of populations from, um, period in the early 70s, or it describes a lot of um, North Atlantic fisheries and um, is locally in this time frame uh, the effect of over harvesting in the ocean. But um, Ben reminded me that if, if they were abundant here and have crashed because of over harvesting in the last 50 years, they were super abundant this graph very much underestimates how abundant the fish were in the past. And there's another, so one obvious kind of threat to fish populations is just overfishing in the ocean. Um, a less obvious one, but the one that's key to our um, story locally is habitat loss inland, right? So these are fish that live in the ocean, um, but require expanses of freshwater lakes and streams in order to reproduce. Um, they don't reproduce in the ocean, they reproduce in freshwater. So how do they get, to, how do they access that freshwater? They enter at the mouths of rivers and travel upstream. You know, they'll travel many, many miles inland upstream to spread out essentially across the landscape. Um, they don't wanna be too crowded. They want, you know, space for their, um, and less competition for food for their young uh, offspring. Um, so anyway, they, they will uh, migrate inland quite, quite a distance if they allow them, if we allow them to. But what this graphic shows is this kind of fascinating, it's, a, it's quite dense to describe and I won't pause here long enough to do justice to it, but it shows the over a uh, period of whatever, 250 years, the, the uh, building of dams. So these black and white and gray spots show dams in New England constructed from 1630 to 1900. And the old, older ones are darker. So you see uh, with European settlement of um, New England, the coast gets um, plugged up by dams, but those dams proliferate into streams inland as well. And um, what these graphs around the edge of this graphic show is the correspond, as these graphs go in, uh, as these dams go in over time, over this historical period, the corresponding loss of inland freshwater habitat for river herring in these various watersheds, these various sub areas. Um, and you can see that they go in the Merrimack watershed went from, you know, lost 90% more of its inland of the inland freshwater habitat for river herring between 1600 and 1900. And so if this fish was abundant in 1940, it was super, super abundant in, um, in uh, before uh, European settlement. Um, and uh, so we're, the populations are now threatened. So what can we do about that? Like what, what possibility of restoring these once super abundant fish is possible? Um, so dams pay, play a key role in this, in both the story of habitat loss, but also the possibility of restoration. So, um, and on the Mystic, so now I'm gonna zoom into just our very local parochial story here on the Mystic River. Um, the, there are four key dams on the Mystic River that play a part in our story. The first is the Amelia Earhart Dam at, the, at Assembly Row in Somerville that, um, separates what's now was built in the 60s, separates what's now the freshwater extent of the Mystic River upstream from the saltwater uh, extent 
below that dam that goes to Boston Harbor. Um, oddly enough, even though it's by far the biggest and sort of most uh, consequential for, for you know, river hydrology and so forth, uh, consequential dam on the river, it's not the main obstacle for river herring. It, it, they, wa water is released at low tide, every low tide from the freshwater section. There's a constant sort of exchange of water. Fish are, this is rather transparent um, uh, to, uh, to river herring. And when the, the operate dam operators see river herring schooling, they're, they're encouraged to allow them to pass through this dam. So this, this one, even though that's the biggest, isn't the biggest problem. The, turned out uh, a key problem was here at Upper Mystic Lake Dam, um, a dam between two lakes that kind of would be one lake if there weren't this dam here um, with a kind of funny shape. But um, uh, it, it, it's an earthen dam that was built in the 19th century, I believe. And for essentially for a hundred years, just kind of simplify the story, prevented um, access of fish from the lower Mystic Lake here into this lake. Um, and uh, so that's, the, so it's fish were able to come up the Mystic River and utilize lower Mystic Lake as breeding habitat, but uh, they weren't able to access upper Mystic Lake. I should also add that the river herring return uh, kind of amazingly to the river they were born in. So the, the, the um, population of fish that were loyal essentially, that had their origins in the Mystic River would return every year, but not be able to get past this point. Um, our organization, so this was an interim solution for some years where uh, we, we organized um, a so-called bucket brigade where people would, including kids, would go with nets and the fish are trying to get past this dam, right? So they, they detect the flow and they're going from the right to the left in this view. And um, they're, they're here, people can catch them in nets, put them in buckets, pull the buckets up to here and essentially pour them into Upper Mystic Lake. So, but this turns out not to be a super efficient uh, method for getting a uh, river herring across a, a dam. What turned out to be an efficient and permanent solution is this uh, so-called fish ladder, which Ben was instrumental in um, implementing at Upper Mystic Lake, uh, with Ben and his colleagues, um, actually, I don't know if Ben was there in 2012, but um, um, a fish ladder, so-called fish ladder. So this is at the top of the structure. The dam was rebuilt in 2012 and this wooden structure was inserted into it. So this is at the top of the ladder, looking down from the Upper Mystic Lake at the bottom of the screen to Lower Mystic Lake at the bottom. And you can see these baffles that form little pools. Um, if water were allowed to flow from the top to the bottom as it is on the right. So these are two pictures of the same structure, one where water is flowing through it and one where it isn't. Um, the fish can essentially, they can't jump 15 feet, but they can you know, traverse a one foot uh, high flow barrier and, uh, and go from pool to pool and sort of jump up this series of baffles like a ladder and their final step is into Upper Mystic Lake at, uh, at the top. And so just to review, so before the Mystic, uh, before this dam, this fish ladder was inserted here exactly at the top of this blue section, um, this was the spawning area, Ooh, very, very super roughly of uh, the spawning area for river herring in the Mystic. After the fish ladder was built, uh, we collectively um, effectively expanded the breeding area for this same population of fish, right? So uh, these fish have been returning. Now they suddenly in 2012 have access to more breeding area uh, because they can traverse that bridge, that dam. Um, so, uh, sorry, I, did, I jumped ahead too fast. So in 2012, we started along with the Division of Marine Fisheries as, as partners um, using protocols they developed, started a program of volunteer monitoring where people literally go to the dam and stand there and count for 10 minute sampling periods. 
how many fish they see going from lower Mystic Lake into upper Mystic Lake. So we did a kind of like collective community-wide experiment. We said, okay, you have a population of fish that has, you know, X amount of area to breed. What happens if you expand that by 1.5 or something like that, like 1.6? You know, uh, what if you effectively double the breeding area? What happens to the population? So it's a an ex kind of natural experiment or, you know, experiment around the, this intervention that happened. And so what were the results? These were the results. So the short version of this is that, so the only thing that changed between 2012 and 2019 is that that ladder, that fish ladder now allows fish to access that upstream habitat. And um, briefly, the, the population more than doubled in that period. So one relatively cheap intervention allowed the restoration of this historically threatened, formerly super, super abundant fish to double its population in a very short time. The, the figure that the, the detail that I left out earlier that really makes this graph come alive for me is that um, I didn't mention that fish weight that so juvenile fish that go back to the ocean stay in the ocean for three or four years because they're not sexually mature yet. There would be no point to their returning because they can't spawn yet. So fish that were born in this in the first year of the fish ladder um, wouldn't have won't didn't return until three years later that is until 2000 and um, and 15 and so we saw this so if that first year intervention had an effect of essentially generating more fish for in this population you wouldn't expect to see the signal in this first year or the second year. You'd expect to see the signal when those fish um, become sexually mature and begin to return. And that's what we saw. And I think this is just a great, like you never see a clear, clean signal like this in, in data that, would, you know, um, environmental data, or it's not that you never do, but it's, it's a really kind of, I think, widely accepted that this, intervention has caused this restoration of this population. Um, uh, there's a story here, and I, I may defer, I may not really pause here on this graph because um, Ben may have a lot more to say about this. So th this was that to this highest dark blue bar was the graph I showed you on the previous screen. The next year was COVID and we didn't monitor in person. So we didn't get in-person data, but we had this surrogate uh, video program that suggested that population went way down here. And, and I think Ben can talk to this, but it's widely attributed. This, this happened statewide, by the way, there were many, many rivers that had the same kind of reduction across these two years. And the, the working hypothesis that, is that it was a drought in 2016, 17, that led to low recruitment or low um, successful integration of juveniles into the adult population. And um, again, you wouldn't, if that happened in 2016, if a lot of juveniles didn't make it in 2016, you wouldn't expect to see the si signal in the first year or the second year, um, or this 16, 17, uh, you'd expect to see it in the third or fourth year when those returning fish would be expected back and didn't come back. But this year's data showed that more than 500,000 fish. So we may have uh, seen a reduction from maybe that drought period and then potentially uh, a, the beginning of a rebound in the, last, in the last year. So anyway, that's the story. I'm gonna pass it off to Ben. I, it, it's a great, again, urban ecological restoration story. Uh, the final point I'll make about this as, as I turn to the next, oh, well, it, let me make this point first, that um, every data point you see here that's represented here, I, can never, I can't stress this enough, comes from volunteers. We didn't generate, that is our staff didn't generate this data. The state employees didn't generate this data. Mystic River volunteers, hundreds of volunteers counting fish generated the data that gives us this public knowledge. I think that's a really cool thing. So what's next in the Mystic? Um, 
there, a fish ladder was built at Center Falls Dam, which now allows fish to get through Winchester. And the next big target is a horn pond up here in, um, in Woburn in the upper watershed. That's the next big lake and would really is, is the target of DM, Division of Marine Fisheries and municipal and state and federal investment. And there's a story unfolding about that, which we can come back to as well. Um, so uh, with that, so this is just my point that every data point we acquired is volunteer um, uh, observation. And um, Daria, my colleague Daria, is the person to reach out to if you would like more information about our monitoring program. So with that, I'll pass it off to Daria and then to Ben. Yeah, yeah, just wanted to say a huge thank you again to everyone who helps with this effort. I know a lot of people who have personally counted herring are on this call right now, so a big thank you to you. And I just put a link in the chat where there's some more information about this year's herring monitoring effort. Um, we are still seeking monitors for Horn Pond and uh, substitute monitors who can help fill in whenever we need someone to um, grab an extra time slot. So we really appreciate if you check out that link and there will also be opportunities to count online too, uh, like Andy mentioned. And now I'll pass it off to Ben to talk about his work statewide. Thanks Andy and Daria. Let me see if I can get my screen shared correctly. Hopefully that'll work out okay. That looks good. So is our people seeing the title slide? Looks great. Yes. All right. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, first off, I want to say thanks to Myra uh, for having me here tonight. I really enjoyed the uh, invitation to speak. It's great to speak about river herring. Lately, I've been speaking about striped bass a little bit more. And, and I really also want to say thank you for everything you do for the watershed. Uh, I tell people all the time that uh, Mystic River Watershed Association is kind of the ideal partner. And they're doing just about everything I would want to do if I could focus on just one watershed. So it's really great to see everything that happens. And obviously, as Andy just concluded with, I'm gonna to plan to start with, thank you to all the volunteers who participate in all these efforts, because without you going out and collecting data, going out and talking to your representatives, talking in your communities, getting letting the, getting the word out about this resource, then you know the resource would not be in as good a place. So thank you. Um, I'm gonna to touch on a lot of the same things and try and kind of color in a lot of the lines that Andy laid out with his great talk. And with that, I will uh, take it away. So um, I also have a kind of a dark sense of humor, sorry. So diagramy, a great idea until people. Um, as Andy mentioned, there's a lot of, it's actually gotten very complicated. There's a number of theories at this point. For a long time, there's kind of one idea about why perhaps diagramy uh, originated and you know the idea that we were at all it was the main theory was that it was a marine groups of fishes that were going into fresh water uh to take advantage of resources or going out, out into salt water to take advantage of resources depending on latitude that idea has been fairly well i'm not gonna say dismissed i think it's true for some species but um there's it basically looks like there's a lot of good reasons and different reasons that different fish in different parts of the world have de developed diagonally there isn't just kind of one broad unifying theory so it's a talk for a whole different time but there's a really great review paper that came out like a year or two ago that i'll try and shoot the link to andy and daria if people want to get that all right so it potentially can do a lot of great things for diadromous fish. Uh, I'm not going to talk exactly about what it is since Andy did that. However, the expansion of human populations, typically, typically highest along shorelines, as we all know, we live there, has had a lot of impacts on diadromous fish. So in 2020 in North America, this life cycle that led to just a tremendous amount of productivity, a tremendous amount of fish all up and down the seaboard has a lot of issues with it. And I'm using the same diagram as Andy here, thankfully. So to make it kind of a silly, but illustrate what's going on here. We have obstructions to passage with dams for these adult adults that are trying to get in for fresh water uh, to spawn. And then also for juveniles trying to get out of fresh water spawn, they can be blocked by dams or get killed going over dams. 
you have all sorts of issues uh, due to anthropogenic effects on nursery habitat quality, water quantity, can you get out? Uh, what is the water quality like? Is it overheated? Uh, is, does it have too many nutrients? Does it have chemicals? All these things that can happen from all of the urbanization that can occur. Once you make it out to the ocean, you have indirect fishing mortality in a bunch of fisheries. In this country, you can have direct fishing in other countries. Trying to get in and out through the estuaries. I mean, we call these nature's potato chips as kind of a joke, but it's because everybody likes to eat them. So there's always death from above. And finally, now we have climate change and all these other anthropogenic impacts that could be getting at the fish. So to be a forage fish like a river herring is to live a life of constant fear and terror. And uh, I do want to stress, as Andy said previously, that this three to four year back for maturity is, is the standard now. And it's important to think about as we talk, as I'll talk about later, just keep that in mind. I also do want to bring up this one of these big changes that's occurred and all the data we have on ages of uh, river herring going back into the 60s and 70s uh, suggests that there was a lot broader of an age structure. Like in a run, you could have 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and 5-year-olds in the spawning population coming back every year. And, and now you're down to typically 3 and 4-year-olds. Even as recently as 2004 in Massachusetts runs we monitored, it was nearly half five-year-olds with a smattering of six and seven-year-olds and then four-year-olds and three-year-olds. And now it's almost entirely three and four-year-olds with an occasional five, six or seven-year-old. Uh, so it's really changed. And what that means is that you kind of get on this seesaw of populations because if you have one or two bad years, your entire, you might only have two or three years in, uh, of fish, your classes of fish in your run at one time. And if you have one of those go bad, it can really lead to some big population swings. So uh, I'm gonna show this figure that's a little bit more complicated, but Andy referenced it. And you can see hopefully my mouse cursor. And so here's the big picture for diagermous fish. This is a great article by Karin Lindbergh and John Waldman that came out about a decade ago. John just put out an update and I haven't updated my figure yet. But you can see that diagermous fish on both sides of the Atlantic here on the United States, North America, and on the European side, it's pretty much uh, a story, better data on the European side, but in the last 100 years, pretty much everything has gone down. Um, here we're talking about this historical stuff. I'm going to zoom this up. It's going to be grainy. I apologize. But we're talking today about blueback, alewife, and American shad, really mostly about the river herring species. But you can see for shad, we have data that goes back a little bit further, um, and you can just perhaps see what, what it might have possibly been in 1800, much higher than what we have now. Same for river herring. We don't really know anything back to like 1875. And, and as, as uh, Andy was explaining, and I'll dive into a little bit more, what could it have really have looked like? So where are we exactly? Uh, this question is a great question. And it was first picked up by Carolyn Hall about a decade ago. So in this figure, what you can see is she went and looked at nine different watersheds in Maine and went through all the historical records. And so you have this same graph more or less that Andy showed of the US total, total US river herring landings from 1950 to close to current 2010 and how it was really high and then it went down. But this figure on the left, you can see it goes from 1600 to 1900. And what you see there is that by the time any of those points on the previous page, let alone these, are showing what, what we might have had as far as just catch, we'd already lost a tremendous amount of production. You know, just so much had already been lost before we had any idea of what was happening. So when you think about it, where we are is really on the tail, the tippiest tip part of the tail of like the dog on, on the production. He's just on this really thin, slender end of what's left of river herring and shad and really a lot of diagonal fish, maybe not striped bass as much, but pretty much every other diagonal fish that we have. Uh, Steve Maddox uh, worked with Carolyn and for his master's degree to kind of update this. He, um, that was the figure of all the dams that Andy showed was uh, part of this paper. And I'm gonna focus more on what was lost. So you can see here, which is not always easy to deal with, this is in metric tons. And each metric, so the MT is a metric ton. And each metric ton is roughly 
a little bit more than the ton we're used to is 2,200 pounds. So if we talk about, you know, we're going to spend most of this talking about uh, how many spawners are returning to the Mystic and other places. And so in metric tons, it's not very helpful. So I'll break that down. A metric ton is 2,200 pounds. A river herring is about, is about three to four adult river herring per pound. So what we're talking about here is a lot of fish. In fact, oh, I'm gonna, I wrote this down here so we can get it. So 600,000 metric tons cumulative to present 2014 from, from uh, 1600. That comes out to, uh, oh, sorry, I'm, I have a helicopter going over and distracted me. And uh, sorry, the 1576 annually comes out to 13.9 million adults lost a year from all the damming in New England. So almost 14 million adult alewife a year are lost to all the dams that we have. And that's 5.25 trillion that have been lost cumulatively over that time period. And that sounds like a lot um, until you look at this lost marine forage where cumulatively there's been 21.2 trillion uh, met, uh, fish lost to marine production. So when we talk about, and I talk about it too, how important all these uh, river herring are to the ecosystem. This is part of what's been lost is a big part of the issue is that all this productivity, all these fish going out every year um, have been lost to all the predators. So try and drill down even more. What does that really mean? Following up on Steve and Carolyn Hall's work, Bia Diaz, a PhD student at UMass Amherst, did some super complex, really interesting modeling and this is an application called EcoPath EcoSim. And as you can see by this great, not big thing of connected things is you can basically recreate an entire ecosystem. So all these little connections are for prey or predator, depending on the color and connecting all the little parts of the marine ecosystem. And I really, all I want you to notice is that this itty little bit, bitty dot right here is an adrenus allocene. So they're talking about river herring and chat. So that's that's how what they're down to now in the current ecosystem by all the numbers we have. She also then tried to say, okay, well, if that's what it is now, these blue bar that you know the it would be the blue in this figure. That's what the contemporary allocene biomass is. What does the re restored situation look like? And so she asked if we restored some of it. And it was not tiny. I mean, it's more than doubling. Here they are, these purple arrow points to what the, the contemporary and restored biomass. What does that mean for all these other species and functional groups? And what you see is that this bit of restoration for river herring leads to far more restoration spread out across the entire marine ecosystem. So it's really a quantitative illustration of what we always talk about when we say restoring river herring benefits the entire ecosystem in the marine food web. She then even took it a step further, and I think it's very important to why we're here tonight, and looked at different scenarios uh, and, and how, what they would mean for the, for the increase, how to get to that restored allicine biomass, basically. And what she found here is that there were three scenarios she ran. The, that black line, was a great, a large reduction in fisheries that either directly catch river herring or indirectly catch them as bycatch. And she modeled everything from 1995 to 2050, as you can see. So that was the first scenario. Fisheries that interact with river herring, a great a large reduction in that effort. The orange line is a reduction in all commercial fisheries, but only to 50% of that 1995 level. And you can see it did not perform as well as a targeted reduction, great large scale reduction of fisheries. It was not much of a difference, but it did not perform quite as well as those targeting those that uh, get river herring in their catch. Now the blue line is the orange scenario plus uh, restoring most of the habitat in three large rivers in Maine. And all of a sudden you see real results. So the, uh, the really important takeaway and part of why I'm really excited about the, to talk to everybody here and excited about the work you're doing and the work that's going on in the Mystic River watershed is that habitat restoration 
at least with all the information we have now, quantitatively seems to be the key more than fishing effort reduction to restoring these species. Um, so one final note about that is like, so what does that mean when we, when I'm gonna, you know, we talk about numbers now when Andy shows you numbers or you see numbers in another talk or I talk about numbers. And um, I did see that Phil was in the, the audience for this, Phil. I'm not, uh, not trying to pick on anybody, Phil, but this is the uh, Back River time series from 1986 to the present. So this is the run in Back River. Phil Lofgren is a herring warden in Weymouth. He does a fantastic job. Uh, it's another watershed where if I didn't have Phil, I'll, if that watershed didn't have Phil, it would not have numbers anywhere near what you're seeing here where they're all up and through here in the past 20 years. They'd be much lower. Phil's tireless and it's fantastic. But my point here is that, so basically this yellow band is the time series mean. And this red band is the first quartile. So it's the first, the lowest 25% of the points. One quarter of the points are lower than this number right here, just above two, maybe 210,000, somewhere in that neighborhood. But in reality, this time series mean here, if you go back to 1963, there were over 300,000 fish harvested from the run. It was supporting a 300,000 fish harvest. So basically the harvest is you know 60 years ago so after all these huge impacts that andy and i just talked about the harvest was still greater than the mean that we have for the count in the last you know 25 years for this run and i think that just stresses that when we talk about restoration it's very important that we think about how far we want to look back what our goals are and what we think is we're able to accomplish. And I, I try and be optimistic. I think it, for me personally, I would like to see rest, meaningful restoration to a you know, pre-1950 level, but it's gonna mean real changes in the way, not just how we manage the fish, but how we live our lives and what we do with our water. So that's my two cents on that. So very briefly, River Harry monitoring in Massachusetts. We have 33 runs, maybe more now, I don't haven't updated this in a year, with abundance data surveys, uh, 14 that we're gonna call census level quality. So we're basically 90 to 95% hopefully accurate and eight runs with a biological data surveys. And our program goal is to establish a joint census count for each uh, in each of these major drainages. And so Mystic is one of these. Mystic we've been biologically sampling for I think since 2006. And we have had the count in some form since 2012, working with Mystic River Watershed Association. So I'm just looking at the state overall. Andy asked me to quickly show something about the overall trends in the state. You can see over the last 20 years, this is an index based on the Namaskat River, Mattapoisett River, which has really dropped off in the last 20 years, the Monument River and the Back River. Um, and you can see this red line for the harvest ban when we really saw a modern era collapse and closed, and that was across the Eastern seaboard. Most states, uh, several states closed their, their fisheries then. Um, then it, by 2012, the ASMFC basically said you needed to have a sustainable fishing management plan or you could not allow harvest. Um, so most states are largely closed now. Um, and you can see here that there is a rebuild after for about a decade after this collapse. And then in 2017, there was a large drop across the state. This is just these four runs, but this is most runs in the state. And then we've been on a kind of descending limb the last two years again. And this is the same figure, just so you can see the individual runs. And it's important to note that really the, that index does not show the drop in 2020 because for whatever reason, the Namaskat River did not see a drop that year. I'm not really sure why that was, but they didn't see it. Uh, that's a, a run that is down and goes into uh, Rhode Island, actually. Uh, it goes into Mount Hope Bay. So it's not a run that I interact with much being in Gloucester. I do also wanna to briefly touch on stocking and dam removals. And I did not do my animations correctly, I apologize. But uh, I think most people probably know about the Penobscot River or have read about the Penobscot River. And every time you read about the Penobscot River, you'll see this big thing about how before the dams, 
there were hundreds or like a thousand fish passing these dams and there was no river herring. And then we removed the dams and three years later, there were like two to three million fish. And what people never talk about or mention in articles is that for the five years before they started doing anything and while they were removing all these dams, they were trucking tens of thousands of fish every year up further up in the watershed past all of these, uh, these obstructions so to seed them with spawning fish so that when the dam came down, there was already kind of a jump start to the population restoration. Um, and that's the same idea on a much larger uh, idea on a much larger scale as to what people were doing in the Mystic with that bucket brigade. But it happened in the Penobscot. Um, it has happened to other places. Here's the Merrimack River graph. Uh, this is a cool. It's happened twice here in the Merrimack. Uh, in the late '80s, they started stocking Lake Winnesquam with fish. There was a huge increase from you know tens of thousands to nearly 400,000 fish. They decided to stop stocking Lake Winnesquam because it was so much effort and see what happened. And the population collapsed again. 20 years goes by um, and we're coupling this effort. We started again in 2012. And again, you know, 2015, 2016, 2015, we see the first bump, 2016, big bump. This was uh, more of a fish passage issue with low water than anything else. And the same with 2020, uh, the lift at Lawrence is not operated well with low water. Um, as far as just, just passing these river herring, they can't get in there. And so what we've seen is that we've got the same response as previously when we stock fish into Lake Winnesquam, and we're coupling that with really timed it to be doing a lot of relicensing in that watershed and improvement, other access improvements. So hopefully we're going to see the long-term gains and get the fish into Winnesquam in the next 20 years on their own. So um, I'm going to now unpack as quickly as I can what Andy was talking about with the recent uh, dive. And so I want to go back really quickly and point out this 2017 drop right back to like when we all freaked out and closed the runs. Really big drop in 2017. And so when we look at rainfall over the past, you know, 2020 to 2014, that's really driving the year classes we have seen and we're going to see in our fishery in Mystic River in the last couple of years. Um, is So here's 2014 in red, and this is difference from the average. So this is this zero would be represents the mean rainfall in Charleston. This is data from the uh, MWRA. And if it's below, so if the any the dot that is below this dashed line means that there was less rain than usual that month and that year. And you can see the percent difference on the side here. And if it's above, it's more. And so what you see is 2014 was below average almost the entire year, especially July was all right, but August and September were poor. And 2013 was also poor as well. I didn't, I don't have it on this figure. And so now think to that 2017 crash around the state. And that's what most likely the cause of that. Now we can look at 2016 and 2017, and you can really see how poor 2016 was in orange here. Very low, you know, 100% less than average all through the spring, a little spike in June, but then really most of the year below average. And it went into 2017. 2017 was not as bad, but it was still, I think, seven months below average, one, or sorry, six below, one at average and five above and it was coming off such a low year so again 2016 2017 poor poor passage years um and i do want to point out too looking to the future here this blue is 2020 through september and i know we're all still thinking about how much rain we had in the last eight months but it was dry from all through 2020 into mid-june of 2021 uh, i don't have high hopes for uh, 2023, 24, or 2024 at all. So I hope I'm wrong, but I don't. And I want to, and also overall on this figure, 63% of the observations were negative. We've just had a dry decade and it has not been great for river herring. But the Mystic River didn't necessarily show that. So here's a popular, different way of looking at the population figure that Andy showed previously from 2012 through 2021. And in 2017, there was no decline. You know, most of the runs in the state showed a big decline, but in 2017, there was no decline here. 
And I saw the same thing on the Charles River. And uh, as far and that was more anecdotal because I did not have hard numbers there. But I'll be honest that in 2017, when the Mystic just kept climbing, I was very optimistic about the chance what the Mystic would do and how resilient it could be to low water years. Because I figured that uh, in my mind, the problem with low water years is that juveniles cannot leave when they want to leave. There's reasons they want to go to salt water, typically because they've eaten most of the food around or they're getting too big and they want they can eat bigger foods. So they want to get out to the salt water for that bigger food, estuaries, and then even into the Gulf of Maine. Uh, and it's not great in a lot of ways, but the locks don't prevent fish from getting out. They can use the locks to get out uh, with the amount of summer boat traffic. So I, my hypothesis after 2017 was that the Charles and the Mystic might be fairly resistant to low water years. And then 2020 happened. So take, I have to re-examine things and admit I don't know things, which I'm actually totally fine with. So getting drilling then down, trying to figure this out, tease it out. Um, there's been three restoration sites that have been active in the last decade in the Mystic River watershed. There's the Upper Mystic Lakes Dam, as Andy was talking about here. The center fall, and that was built during 2011 and came online in 2012. So the passage occurred starting in 2012. The center falls dam was built, the, the fishway there was built in 2016 in November and December, and then was uh, fish could use it in 2017, but I, you'll see I put a 2015 here and I'll get into that in a second. And then fish passage at Horn Pond, I'm putting 2015 through ongoing. So let's explore that a little bit more. So this is a picture in May of 2015. There is uh, our intrepid leader of the Diagemus program, Brad Chase, uh, peering, gazing soulfully at the water at the outlet of Horn Pond because we had gotten a phone call that there were river herring there and we were not expecting that. But sure enough, we did see a number of river herring that were at the base of the uh, this low flow outlet or the high flow outlet. And also some were making it up to the top. And what we ended up discovering was that the, there's pictures from the fishway going at Center Falls Dam. And you can see these two yellow circles is that in 2014 and 2015, they had had to do a lot of work on basements of buildings in downtown Winchester. And to get the water low enough so they didn't have water seepage into these basements, they opened these gates that drain through these holes fully. And it appears that it was not, that their velocity was not high enough to prevent river herring, even though there was no fish ladder here at the time, to prevent river herring from going up the river. So they were able to use this drawn down dam because of the type of gate they had, which was a gate that instead of going from the top up or the bottom down, open sideways, it's called the butterfly gate. So it would be a closed. And when they open it, it turns parallel with the flow and perpendicular to parallel with the flow and the fish could go through. So some probably maybe in 2014, but definitely in 2015, fish started getting into Horn Pond. And then in July of 2017, when uh, the city of Woburn rebuilt the Scally Dam at Horn Pond, they were nice enough to let uh, me take command of their contractors for a day. And I got to basically just tell two different guys and excavators where to put rocks, which was amazing. Could move rocks far larger than anything I could ever move. And it took like three hours instead of two weeks. And it was truly awesome. And you can see all this fresh rock that's been placed and moved through here, uh, trying to make it more passable than it had been in 2015 and 2016 and 2017, tried to improve that situation. And since then, now what you'll see if you go to Horn Pond in the springtime is myself and my technicians moving rocks down there, trying to tweak it. And that's something that we have to do both at the beginning of the year because stuff's moved around or people have moved around things in the off season or because uh, as flows change, you have to manipulate it a little bit. It's not really a fish way. We're just making the best of the situation. So now it's a slightly more complicated picture. We have the ladder in 2012. We have alewife seen in Horn Pond in 2015. The ladder completed between 2016 and 2017. A ramp rebuild at Horn Pond. Oh, one second, please. I'll uh, take this time to say that we're, we are coming up on seven o'clock. 
Um, so I'll leave my email in the chat if you have any remaining questions. Um, but if you want to pop any of your last questions in the Q&A box, feel free to do so. Yeah, sorry, Daria, I'm running long. No worries, Daria. Um, so a little bit more complicated of a situation than what we thought we had. And oh, let me get back on this. And so what we I think we've seen now is a bump from 2012 through 2016 from that initial ladder at Upper Mystic Lakes Dam, and then a second upward bump from fish getting into Horn Pond. And what might have happened with this recent drop, Andy, and this is my hypothesis at the moment, is what we're seeing is the fluctuation in Horn Pond, because Horn Pond, when it goes dry, they're going to lose any exit out of there. So all this production that we were probably seeing in these years, it was coming from somewhat from Horn Pond or mostly from Horn Pond fish spawning there. Mm -hmm. And then in 2016 and 17, when it was so dry, we did not get those fish. And we jumped back down to some level that was mostly the Mystic Lakes dams, uh, reservoirs around Mystic Lake Dam. So it'll be interesting then to understand what the future of the Mystic is. What are the long-term trends going to be? Honestly, with the amount of restoration work we have going on now, and we're going to have hopefully a real fishway at Horn Pond in the next four years. Uh, we might know by 2030 or 2035, but these things take time to flesh out. Uh, what's below, what are we, what's the real number for the Mystic River? Cause we probably, if I had to guess, have another hundred to 200,000 blueback spawning that we never count at the dam. Finally, we still have improvements to make uh, throughout the watershed. We need to work on downstream passage at the dam and we're constantly in dialogue with DCR to make that happen. Um, we could improve our locking protocols with better information. There's a lot of things we could still improve. And finally, this last bullet about water quality and quantity and climate change. I'm just really glad that the Mystic River Watershed Association is here to keep an eye on things and work with everybody else to make sure that as the world changes around us, we're doing the best we can for the river. I went long, I apologize. And if there's time, I'll take any questions. That was awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. For fleshing out that story. It's really cool to see the numbers uh, coming in from all around the state and in similar herring counting efforts. Um, we do have a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, first is from Jennifer, who asks, uh, is the prohibition of swimming in the Mystic Lakes related in any way to protecting slash improving water quality for the nursery? Uh, I, I'll, I'll jump. In. So I think no, I think it's not at all connected with that. So you can, I mean, people do swim in Upper Mystic Lake and Lower Mystic Lake, frankly. Um, but I think it's a safety issue, frankly. It's, uh, there's a swimming beach at Upper Mystic Lake, but I don't think, uh, Ben, swimming, uh, healthy, healthy river herring habitat in a lake the size of Upper Mystic Lake uh, is consistent with people swimming in it. Yes. Yeah. No. The, the, we, it'd be. I would guess that it's probably a seasonal closures around a human, you know, like the standard of the water and water quality. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no. The, certainly nothing to do with the fish. Okay. Next question um, is from Jan, who asks, "Do the fish still try to head over toward Alewife Station?" An alewife station, isn't that in the Charles? No, 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 no. Oh, it's the, it's the brook off the side. Yes, as far as yeah. I know, they do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the thing, the, the alewife brook, obviously named after these super abundant fish when people, when English speakers started naming things here. Um, the, alewife brook is a highly, um, uh, um, it's a brook with a lot of pollution problems. One side effect of that um, and various other factors is that it has very, very, very low dissolved oxygen in the water column in the summer, like, you know, one milligram per liter, um, kind of reliably so. And um, long, series of possible explanations for that. But I, I, I suspect that river herring, even if they turn into Alewife Brook, probably don't want to spend a lot of time there. There's a pond at the other end as well. And I, I suspect they, they, 
if I were a fish, I would turn left into Alewife Brook and then go back to the Mystic and, and head to points north. But. Not the best place to be for a little river herring there. Um, next question is from David Messina, whose images you saw today. Thanks, David, for taking so many great pictures of our river herring. Um, David asks, to what degree is predation of returning fish at the Upper Mystic Lake Dam and the Earhart Dam not opening, uh, causing the lower numbers of returning adults? Yeah, David, that's a great question. Um, and it's a hard one because as we talked about, the river herring are really a part of their function is to be eaten, is to be predated upon. And that's it's part of why they're so great and so important. Um, what we have tried to do at DMF is make sure that what, you know, all these structures are not increasing the predation more than they need to. And that's when it starts to be problematic. And I think that the downstream uh, predation, of, whether it's juveniles or adults coming downstream over the dam uh, at Upper Mystic Lakes Dam has been an issue. And we've been working with DCR to try and solve that. It's not going as quickly as we'd like, but we're in constant dialogue with them and hope to be making, I think COVID really, we we're finally making some progress. And then COVID, I think like everything else slowed that down. Um, we just haven't been able to get them to engage on that as much as we'd like, but hopeful that that'll happen now as we're starting to loosen up a little bit and we just re uh, started dialogue about it in the past few weeks. So hoping that it's gonna happen. And then I, I think that we can always op improve the op lock operation. Uh, we do have a protocol with, with DCR that they follow that provides for a lot of opportunity for them to get out. The question is, if there's something else we can do to provide more orientation, there may be behavioral things. These fish want to follow flow. So if there's some way we can get some behavioral flow things happening, if we address it as a problem, if anybody sees like lots of fish, just, you know, small millions of small river herring at the locks and then they're not, and they're swarming there and they can't figure out a way out. That's important information. And, you know, I'm not out on a boat on the mystic every day. So I really do stress if people who boat on the mystic, if you see this, please tell Andy, tell Daria, tell me, um, let us know so we can fix problems and address these things. Yeah, please always. <laughs> we love getting emails from people about things that they're observing in the watershed because we definitely can't be <laughs> out, out in every place all at one time. And um, like a lot of things, a lot of value comes from volunteers and our community members uh, bringing stuff to our attention. And with that, I think that's all the questions in the Q&A box. Um, I'll just say a huge thank you to everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, and especially thank you to Ben for coming and um, and speaking at our webinar. We really appreciate it. And of course, we love working with you um, and are looking forward to another herring season. So um, with that, I hope everyone has a great night. Um, again, my email's in the chat if, if you have any further questions. And thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.